Heavenly Father, once again, as we consider your prophetic word, we ask that you would bless us with your presence. We ask for your Holy Spirit and your angels to be in attendance, and that uh, the information shared here, here would be for your glory and honor, and be truthful and honest. And we ask that as the Sabbath is approaching, that you um, help us get the things done today that we need to in order to enter into the Sabbath the way you would have us to. And we thank you for blessing us so far in the production of uh, this series of meetings. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the title of this presentation is The Scattering. And uh, about two years ago, roughly, um, a few friends of mine discovered the series of articles by Hiram Edson and they were from the 1850 Review and Herald, and they were interesting to me, and people knew that the, the friends knew they'd be interesting to myself because Hiram Edson, in this series of articles, and this series of articles, by the way, is at the conclusion of this presentation in your syllabus. Um, I think it's five or six articles, about 50-some pages. But in Hiram Edson's study, the premise of his study that was that the 2,520 years of Leviticus 26 was correct, but that William Miller had been incorrect in beginning that time prophecy when the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity, and he suggested that the time prophecy should begin when the northern kingdom, Israel, was taken into captivity in the year 723. So as he addresses that issue, he is dealing with the scattering and uh, the time of the Gentiles because it's Hiram Edson's conclusion in this article that the scattering is also representing the time of the Gentiles in Bible prophecy. And Hiram Edson determines that in 1798, if you begin the 2520 and 723, that the scattering takes place until 1798 and 1798 is the finishing of the time of the Gentiles. Um, several years ago, I did a study personally to respond to a brother who I believe was incorrect, and I had determined, determined that the time of the Gentiles ended in 1844. And uh, so all, when the brethren found Hiram Edson's articles, they knew, the friends of mine, they knew that I would be interested in them because as Hiram Edson draws his conclusions in this articles, which you have in the syllabus, um, he shows from Bible prophecy that after the scattering, the Lord promises to gather his people together a second time, and the Lord also identifies that he is going to gather his people together in a specific geographic location, and in his conclusions, uh, several times Hiram Edson says that the place that the Lord would gather together um, his remnant people, his modern covenant people, would be the United States of America. And there is even a place where uh, Hiram Edson in this article identifies the glorious land of Daniel 11, verse 41, as the United States of America. And that's why the friends of mine knew that that would be of interest to me, because I've been presenting uh, that the glorious land of verse 41 of Daniel 11 is the United States for quite some time, and there's an argument about that. And here we had discovered a pioneer that understood the same things for some very sound reasons. He, sh he shows from um, the Old Testament prophets that when the Lord was going to raise up his final covenant people that he's going to do it in the United States of America. And uh, his reasoning sound. But caused me a little bit of a, not a shaking, but I didn't accept the idea that 1798 was the, was the end, was the time of the Gentiles because I had already come to understand it was 1844 and it, Took me a while to sort through this and realize that these things need to be considered together. You know, and then you can start putting some sense to the fact that the time of the Gentiles ended in 1844 and, uh, and 1798. So as, as this understanding, and it's just been over the past couple of years for myself, as I've been coming to understand um, the theme of the scattering in Bible prophecy, I, I realize now, for myself, when you read the Old Testament, um, you, you just can't read the Old Testament without seeing that that was something that was under discussion. And, and if in, in truth, 
the Bible says that this subject of the, the indignation of God, there's places where this subject is being discussed by the Bible, Bible prophets, and as it's being discussed, there's a phrase in there that goes like this, as has been testified to by all the prophets. I mean, so this is one of the themes in Bible prophecy that the Bible of, says of itself, this is a theme that all the prophets spoke about, is this indignation of the 2520. Here at the end of the world, we don't know anything about the 2520, but the Bible says all the prophets were speaking about this. So um, this particular study here, the scattering, uh, it's not only found in Zechariah. We're going to look at Zechariah a little bit and try to show some of the truths connected with this. Not to say that Zechariah is the only place that you can view this, but just to give you, um, you know, a foretaste of what you're going to find as you test this information. Because as a student of prophecy at the end of the world, when you hear someone sharing something like this, you have the responsibility to go home and test it through your own studies and prayers. And I'm certain that you're going to find uh, that this theme once you're, once you're looking for what God's indignation is, what God's scattering is, what, what uh, the promise of bringing together Judah and Israel into one group of people at the end of the world, what that means, you're going to find it all over the Bible. So in this um, sermon, Sermon 11, The Scattering, um, we start, of course, with a quote from early writings, which we've already read enough times not to read again, and we know that when Sister White's leading into the endorsement of the 1843 chart up here, She's emphasizing the scattering and the gathering. So with that in mind, we'll start with Zechariah, and you see the verses we're going to read on page 100 of your syllabus. The Lord, and we're going to relate to this passage the way that we always do in our prophetic studies, that um, there's a, a quote in Selected Messages, book two. I'm thinking page 121. I have it for you if you need it after uh, where Sister White says, each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our day than the days in which they lived, so that their prophesying is in force for us. And then she quotes 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen as an example. So we're relating to this passage as if Zechariah, this passage is speaking about the end of the world. And it, and it is. The Lord has been sore, disp sore displeased with your fathers. Now if we're going to place this at the end of the world, with you and I, if the Lord has been sore, sore displeased with our fathers, who's he displeased with? Uh, he's been displeased with um, Adventism since 1844. They made a wrong direction somewhere along the line. The Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you. There, it's Selected Messages, book one, book one, page 121, I just quoted it, and it was the wrong quote. Here's the quote from Selected Messages, book one, page 121. The greatest and most urgent of all our needs is for a revival. To seek for this is our first work. Paraphrase, but that's what she says. And here, this is what Zechariah is saying. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers. Uh, there's several examples. Be ye not as your fathers in 1888, who would not receive the message. You know, if wherever, whatever history you want to insert there. Unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? No, the prophet was laid to rest in 1915. By my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers, but my words. And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so if he dealt with us. Now if you go a little bit further in the chapter, it's going to mention the, the powers that have scattered Israel. Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he said, saying, they are the, these are the four horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast at the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. There was four powers that scattered Israel. Um, if, you, if you relate this to Daniel chapter 8, that began with the Medes and Persians and then went to Greece. 
and then pagan Rome, and then papal Rome. There's four powers that scattered Israel. But there's four carpenters that are going to put things back in order. And I would submit to you that it's in the process of the four angels' messages of Revelation 14 and 18 that the Lord reestablishes uh, his people that gathers them together. In Zechariah 2, verses 1 through 13, it says, I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Now, there is a place... If you, if you uh, turn to Revelation 10, I sometimes get in trouble when I don't stay with my notes. So I might be getting in trouble right here, time-wise. Revelation 10, verse 11 John has just had the bitter disappointment. And in verse 11, it says, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And there was given me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. And back here in Zechariah, Zechariah sees a man that's going to go measure Jerusalem. I wonder, is he seeing John? Because it's the same time. It's the same time period. And behold, the angel that talked with me, I'm back on my notes on page 101, top of the page in Zechariah chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For, the, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come from the for north. Come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. This is the second or and the fourth angel's message. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the, glory hath he sent, uh, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I shall... I will shake my hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. And I would submit to you that this is specifically dealing with Adventism. Second angel, fourth angel's message, this is identifying when the Lord is going to gather his people together and he, the gathering takes place at the, the conclusion of the second angel's message. We, we made a point yesterday in one of our presentations that the second angel's message closes when the third angel's message begins, October 22nd, 1844, when the door closes in the Philadelphian church, when the door closes in the parable of the ten virgins. Does that the, where the second angel's message closes, and that message is a call out of Babylon, and here we're seeing the call out of Babylon, and I would suggest that you can relate to these. Um, this passage here is the second or the fourth angel's message, but in this time period that's under discussion here in Zechariah, the Lord is raised up out of his holy habitation. Um, and of course, there was a movement during that time period of the Lord in his holy habitation from where? From the holy place to the most holy place. So we're, we're moving down through Zechariah for the purpose of, of leading to a, a special spot in Zechariah, and we're trying to nail down the fact that Zechariah is dealing with Adventism at the end of the world. And one of the things that I want you to see in there, if you will, is that in the very last part of that passage, the Lord is going to choose Jerusalem again. And I mean, if you, if you run the phrase, choose Jerusalem through your Bible, you'll find that it's mentioned more than once 
Jerusalem is the city that the Lord did choose, and he chose it in the time period of ancient Israel, and he establishes it and chooses it again at the end of the world when he raises up his denominated people, October 22nd, 1844. That was Zechariah 1 and 2. We're moving into Zechariah 3 and the Seventh-day Adventists. We know that Zechariah 3 is dealing with Adventism, particularly the very closing period of Adventism when the Day of Atonement is finishing up. In Prophets and Kings, page 587, it says, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the Great Day of Atonement. This is Zechariah chapter 3. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress. So we need to understand that Zechariah is a book that is specifically dealing with Adventism. With us, you and I, here at the end of the world. So when we, get, when we look at Zechariah 3, verses 8 to 10, it is also very specific to this day and age. It says, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. What's the one day when the iniquity of Israel is removed? The Day of Atonement. And at the end of the world, the Day of Atonement isn't a single day. It's the judgment time, beginning in October 22nd, 1844, until Michael stands up and human probation closes. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. We looked at this earlier, the next passage from Zechariah 4, but I, I hope you're seeing, the, seeing that Zechariah is Adventism, Adventism, Adventism. This is about us. This is a, a message for us. Chapter 4, and uh, this, we're beginning with uh, verse 1, I guess. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that waketh out of his sleep and saith, said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I've looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Zerubbabel. How do you like to pronounce that? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Okay, I always say it wrong, sorry. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel shall, thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Who will bring forth the headstone? Zerubbabel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Notice, Zerubbabel is laying the foundation, and he's just been, we've just been told he's going to put the headstone. Zerubbabel, whoever Zerubbabel is, is laying the foundation and the capstone of this house that's being built. Of course, we've already discussed that the beginning of this chapter is the Millerite time period, when the foolish virgins and the wise virgins of the Millerite time period woke up on Oct in the midnight cry time period and found on October 23rd, 1844, that they didn't understand the furnishing of the sanctuary. And they had to, what? Measure the temple and the people that worship therein. Um, Revelation 10, 11 and 11, 1 and 2. And so this passage places us right into the beginning of Adventism. And instead of the angel answering, that's the, the uh, seven-branch candlestick in the holy place when Zerubbabel, or when, when Zechariah, wanted to understand what it was, he points him to the work of the Holy Spirit that has just taken place, has just taken place in this history. Um, in the midnight cry time period from August 12th through 17th, the Exeter camp meeting, this midnight cry arrives in the Millerite time period, and in, less, in approximately two months, the midnight cry is carried across the United States, leading to the great disappointment. This is the time period that, that this... Um, passage is dealing with, and then instead of instructing Zechariah, this is a, 
piece of furnishing in the holy place. He points him to the work of the Holy Spirit, which has just take, taken place. And he says, now I want to symbolize the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you about the work of the Holy Spirit by employing the name Zerubbabel. And he says, what I want you to understand about Zerubbabel is he's symbolic of the beginning of this work and the end of this work. He's symbolic of the capstone and the foundation. So if we go back in here, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent you sent me unto you, for who hath despised the day of small things? That's important to me. That's important to me, the day of small things. We'll talk about that in a moment. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then I answered and said unto him, What are the these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest not what, thou, what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Zerubbabel means offspring of Babylon or out of Babylon. Zerubbabel was a, a human being that existed during that time period, but his name is symbolic of the call out of Babylon. And what's being taught here is that the foundation of Adventism takes place in the midnight cry of the second angel's message, which called people out of Babylon, and the, the foundation is pointing forward to the finishing, the capstone of Adventism, when once again the fourth angel's message is a call out of Babylon. In other words, Adventism ends where it began. And that's why you find so many places in Scripture where we're told the Millerite time period is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world. And the, the power of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the Millerite time period was a symbol of the sealing of God's people at the end, 144,000. Notice what Haggai 2, 21-23 says. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heavens and earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathens, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one of them, by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shiltiel, saith the Lord, and I will make him as a signet. What's a signet? For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. A signet is a seal. Zerubbabel is, a, is symbolic of a seal. And there was a sealing process that went on in the midnight cry of the second angel's message that was prefiguring the sealing of the 144,000. And the second angel's message is a call out of Babylon, and the fourth angel's message is a call out of Babylon. And the foundation of Adventism was laid by Zerubbabel, the call out of Babylon, the sealing of those people, the wise virgins back then, and it's pointing forward to this very same action at the end of the world. And this is simply another argument that one of the, the components of that history is right here on this chart, right here on this chart. It's another argument to say that this chart should have some relationship to here at the end, in that time period, whatever that relationship might be. Now, look at Prophets and Kings, page 103. Talking about the time period of Zechariah when the temple was being restored and rebuilt. The work of restoration and reform carried on by the returned exiles under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah presents a picture of the work of the spiritual restoration that is to be wrought in the closing days of this earth's history. It's representing that story, that work, is representing the work that is to go on now. The closing days of this earth's history. The remnant of Israel were a feeble people exposed to the ravages of their enemies, but through them God purposed to preserve in the earth a knowledge of himself and his law. They were the guardians of the true worship, the keepers of the holy oracles. Varied were the experience that came to them as they rebuilt the temple and the wall of Jerusalem. Strong was the opposition they had to meet. Heavy were the burdens borne by the leaders in this work, but these men moved forward in unwavering confidence and humility of spirit and in firm reliance of, upon God, believing that he would cause the truth to triumph. 
like King Hezekiah, Nehemiah clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, and the Lord was with him. The spiritual restoration of which the work carried forward in Nehemiah's day was a symbol is outlined in the words of Isaiah. They shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities. They, shall be, they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the past to dwell in. Brothers and sisters, this is the foundations that God's people at the end of the world are going to restore and raise up. And these foundations are going to identify the paths to walk in. The prophet here describes a people, notice this, the prophet here describes a people who, in a time of general departure from truth and righteousness, could we say that by and large, the Seventh-day Adventist church, within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there has been a general departure from truth and righteousness? Would that be fair to say? Because that's what this history was, and Sister White says that this history represents what's going on in the very closing scene. She says it in this passage. I'm not saying it. Inspiration says it. In the first paragraph we read, it says a, a work of spiritual restoration that is to be wrought in the closing days of this earth's history. And then in the, pro, the paragraph we're looking at now, she says the prophet here describes the people who in a time of general departure from truth and righteousness are seeking to restore the principles that are the foundation of the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, when it comes to this final work, the foundation of that were laid by Zerubbabel are the foundations that were laid uh, in the second angel's message time period. It was laid in the pioneer time period, and those foundations is the, the map of what takes place at the end. Are seeking to restore the principles that are the foundation of the kingdom of God. They are the repairers of a breach that has been made in God's law, the wall that he has placed around his chosen ones for their protection and the obedience to whose precepts of justice, truth, and purity is to be their perpetual safeguard. And in Jeremiah 6.16, there's a, a, a classic Bible text that goes right along with this. And many times, Sister White ties together Isaiah 61 and 58 with Jeremiah 6.16. It says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path. It doesn't, doesn't say, ask for the new church growth seminars. It doesn't say, ask for the light that's coming out of Willow Creek. It doesn't say that. It says, ask for the old pass. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. We won't. We're not going to do it. Was Jeremiah speaking about the end of the world? I think so. That's what the Bible says. In the passage that we read from Zechariah, there's a question raised. For who has despised the day of small things? Brothers and sisters, if you go back to that history, you know, when they come back to rebuild the temple, you remember the story? There was some, some elderly people that could remember what the temple would look like before they were carried into captivity. And what did they do? They wept. And, and you would think, well, that, that's a valid thing to do. They're seeing, you know, that the, they're degenerating, but that, that wasn't a valid thing to do. They were supposed to be praising the Lord, that the Lord was rebuilding the temple. And they brought a hindrance into the work. Brothers and sisters, we have the same possibility here at the end of the world. We can de despise the day of small things. And, and what's the day of small things? I'll give you an example of small things that we can despise. This is a small thing. This right here, this 1843 chart, that's just one little small thing about the pioneer time period. And God's people, by and large, they've despised the pioneer time period, whether they know it or not, because they no longer know what it is. As God's people here at the end of the world, we're no longer familiar with what took place from 1840 to 1844. And brothers and sisters, there are text after text in the Bible and spirit of prophecy that says that we are to continue to teach and present those truths, that history, repeat it to our children, repeat it to the church. 
There's a place where she says it's the sacred responsibility to repeat that history. That history is not a small thing, but some of it despise it as if it is a day of small things. And some people can despise this as if it's a small thing and this history that is represented here. And brothers and sisters, as we do that, we're paralleling the days of Zechariah. In Isaiah 10 and Isaiah 11, verses 10 through 13, Isaiah says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now, if you've ever taken the Ellen White CD ROM and rum that verse, you will find, very easy, it's not, there's no wiggle room on this. The, the ensign that is raised up in this day is the Sabbath. There's, and there's, Sister White articulates this in a few different ways, but it's always the same thing. Sometimes she says it's the, the character of Christ is this ensign. Sometimes she says it's the law of God. Sometimes she says it's the Sabbath. And sometimes she says it's God's people perfectly reflecting God's character during this time. But it's always the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. It's God's character demonstrated by his people during the Sabbath Sunday crisis time period when the Sunday law is being brought against all of mankind. That's the ensign that is lifted up. So and in that day, the Sunday law time period, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign to the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day, in that day, in the Sunday law crisis time period, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Now, brothers and sisters, what we're saying here with this study of the 2520 and the 1843 chart is that Hiram Edson determined that starting the 2520-year prophecy in 677, as William Miller did, was incorrect, that you should start it in 723 when the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. And therefore, the time prophecy ends in 1798. And then according to Hiram Edson's reasoning, the time of the Gentiles and the scattering time was over, and therefore God is gathering his people together a second time. But the reality of it is, is both William Miller and Hiram Edson were correct. This prophecy that Hiram Medson focuses on is emphasizing the trampling down the scattering because you clearly see um, both paganism's 1260 years, papalism's 1260 years of trampling down in this one time period. And the, the passage that William Miller, the history that William Miller points to is emphasizing the covenant that was broken. It was broken here, it was broken here, but the message of this time prophecy is covenant. Broken covenant, reestablished covenant. Hiram Edson says time of the Gentiles is done here. You can make a case and we'll show you in the following study, time of the Gentiles ends here. This 46 year time period is the time period where Christ is stretching out his hand for a second time to gather his people, the scattering and the gathering. But what, what have we been emphasizing through here? That in this time period, 1840 to 1844, there is a history that is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And part of that history of 1840 to 44 is that Christ was gathering a group of people together for the second time. And you know what? Isaiah very clearly here states that in the Sunday law time period, the Lord is going to stretch forth his hand and gather together his people once again. There's a gathering of people together in 1844 that meets all the prophetic criteria, but 1844 is part of a history that's repeated, and there's a scattering that has taken place in Adventism since 1844. What do we call that scattering? We call it the Laodicean condition. We call it in Ezekiel 37 that somehow, some way, God's people have become spiritually dead and become a valley of dead, dry bones. That's why Sister White says our greatest need is for a revival, and to seek this should be our first work. Since 1844, God's people have become scattered, and he's going to gather them, together, gather them together again. And Isaiah here is talking about that second gathering, because he's talking about the second gathering, 
that takes place when the Sunday law lifts the Sabbath up for all mankind to make a choice over. So, brothers and sisters, when we realize the significance of this chart and that history and we realize that we're starting to understand things from this chart, the Lord is still removing his hand from truths of this chart, what does it mean? It means that the gathering, the final gathering, is beginning to take place. The gathering that is the development of the 144,000. Early writings, page 74, in the scattering. In the scattering, in terms of the 2520, we're talking about in this history, in the history of the Dark Ages, in the history of the Dark Ages, in the, in the scatterings, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect. How many good, strong, commandment-keeping churches do we know of that were raised up during the Dark Ages? Just didn't happen. In the scatterings, effort made to spread the truth had but little effect. In the time period that Adventism has been wandering in the wilderness of Laodicea, efforts to spread the truth have had but little effect. Either way you want to apply that. Sister White, Sister White's clear if you pull together the text. I mean, in Adventism, we take the passage um, where we're told, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. And some of us are tempted to say, well, we've got missionaries in almost every country in the world, or we do have missionaries in every country of the world, and once we get them in every city of the world, the end will come. If you take that passage and look at inspiration, what it says, the, the gospel gets carried to all the world in the latter rain. It's the gospel that goes to the world in the latter rain that brings the end. It's not the gospel that gets, you know, talked about in the time period of Laodicea because we're in the scattering. And in the scattering... Efforts made to spread the truth have had but little effect. Accomplished but little or nothing. But in the gathering, now. Why do I say now? Because the evidence is that God is beginning to gather his people together. Based upon the history of when he did it in the beginning of Adventism, we are paralleling that history now. And God is ready to work with his people who are willing to to take this message and run with it. Write the vision and make it plain that he who readeth may run. Accomplish but little or nothing, but in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. All should be united and zealous in the work. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4. I hope that this is starting to take on a relevance to you, your heart like it has to mine. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, is present truth again. It was present truth in the Miller right time period. You know, there's some, there's some passages in Scripture that become present truth. You know the, the passage in Scripture that says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous? You know that Scripture? That's present truth. That's present truth. But you know what? In the very near future, that's no longer going to be present truth. We're, we're approaching the time when there is no advocate for sin if we sin. We can't sin because probation's about to close. Passages in Scripture, depending on circumstances, they are, they're always true, but there's times when they are present truth. And we know that Habakkuk and Ezekiel 12 were present truth in the Millerite time period. And I'm, I'm making the argument here that we've reached the point that they're present truth again. So Habakkuk 2, Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what sh I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. What's the appointed time for our vision? Daniel 11, verse 41. Revelation 13, 11. The Sunday law where the United States speaks as a dragon. That's the appointed time. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak. The United States is going to speak like a dragon at the end. That's what the Bible says. And not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Brothers and sisters, 
The tarrying time is almost over, according to this passage. Son of man, what is the proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease. And they shall more, no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. Now, I, I know this word vision is chalzon. It means complete vision. But I understand that passage is the effect of every vision. This is the time period where not only are the, is the vision of how the papacy returns to take control of the world, um, the message of the hour, but the effect of the vision of Christ in the most holy place is going to come to pass to those people that will enter into him. This is where he brings all the visions um, to fulfillment. For there shall no more be any vain vision nor flatter, flattering divination within the house of Israel. And brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, but there are many uh, vain visions in the house of Israel. And I'm not just talking about the foolish new theology that is sounded in Adventism. I'm talking about some serious-minded people that have made the mistake of taking Bible prophecy and turning it into a doctrine. Bible prophecy is never supposed to be a doctrine. And somewhere in our wandering in the, the wilderness of Laodicea, we've came to understand Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 in such a way that when we stand in front of people doing our evangelistic series, we can tell them Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Revelation 13, Revelation 14, and we've turned it into a doctrine, and we don't address the prophetic word as if it's a light that's to continue to unfold till the end of the world, and we have nothing relevant to say about what's going on on earth today, and there is much to say from Bible prophecy about what's going on earth today. That's a vain vision. It's time to stop that. It's time to get our message in tune with the signs of the times. And when we do, when we do, efforts to save the lost will have their designed effect. For there shall no more be any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall no more be prolonged, no more prolonged, for in your days, O rebellious house, for these days here, in these days, Will I say the word and will perform it, say the Lord God? Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they are of the house of, house of Israel, say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesies of times that are far off. Brothers and sisters, do you know what, what Ezekiel's emphasizing here? He's using the rule of Bible prophecy that upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. He's making sure he repeats this twice, so we understand this is certain. This is certain. The Lord is not holding back any longer. He's going to bring to pass the prophetic word. Therefore saith unto them, thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. Brothers and sisters, in the history of Zechariah, one of the, the stumbling blocks, one of the mistakes that was made back then, is there was a group of God's people back then that they despised the day of small things. And the day of small things was the day of the beginnings, the foundation. We can't despise that foundation because the capstone is the same. That's what Zechariah is teaching. Sister White says, the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the letter. She says, the seven thunders represents the history of 1840 to 44 and future events that will be disclosed in their order. Revelation 10, the mighty angel comes down. Sister White's clear. That's Christ coming down. August 11th, 1840, to empower the first angel's message. And in verse 10, you have the bitter disappointment. That's the history of 1840 to 1844. And the next verse says you're going to have to do this all again. Sister White says the second angel's message, which is the same message as the fourth angel's message, represents the two times that Christ cleansed the temple at the beginning and end of his ministry. Here we have another indication of the repeat of that history. And here Zechariah is saying the foundation of this work is Zerubbabel and the capstone is Zerubbabel. Once again, that history is repeated and one of the, the dangers of God's people in the story of Zechariah is to despise the foundations of Adventism because they are the history that allows us to understand. That's the history that allows us to understand what is at the end. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that look to your work and view it in its correct light. Help us not to be among those that 
take the work that was carried on in the Millerite time period and assign it to some historical trash can that has no relevance to us. Help us to recognize that several times inspiration for us has compared that history with the history of when you brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea. And you so often warned them to remember that. We must remember that history. And let us be among those that do this very thing that we can be convicted that you are now once again gathering a people together and the people that you're gathering together now are coming to a time period where there is no more advocate for sin. The people that you're gathering together now are the people that all the Bible prophets have spoken about that stand during a time when there's no intercessor and that they must have perfected their character before the crisis hits. Please allow us to see this and be part of that number that finishes this work, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.